I'm talking today about infrastructure for national development. Can you hear that now, when you think of the way Australia has developed over the last hundred years, a hundred years ago uh, we wrote a new constitution uh, for Australia. And in that constitution, the state governments yielded up some of their powers to the federal government. The state governments were virtually separate countries at that time. Uh, they had their own uh, national s capitals, they had their own ports, their own railway systems of different gauges, and they were running effectively separate state economies virtually as separate nations. They had their own postage stamps, they even had their own defence forces, they collected taxes and dispersed their own revenue. So the states of Australia were virtually independent countries. When they formed the Federation of Australia, that was a federation of independent states and the states gave only limited powers to the uh, federal government. They were ma the powers that were given to the federal government were mainly concerned with defence and that was because the, the Russians at that time had been coming across Siberia and were uh, even threatening Japan. There was, a, there was a fight between Japan and Russia at the turn of the century and so there was concern about uh, Russian imperialism and the states of Australia decided uh, to, um, if you like, form a federation for their defence purposes. The Australian government then had powers in foreign affairs and defence. Because telecommunications and the telephone had just been starting up at that time and the telephone wires were going across state borders, the federal government was given powers for telecommunications. But virtually nothing else. Uh, the Australian, this federal government, did not have powers for things like water or um, uh, electricity or energy matters, mining, manufacturing, all of those were responsibilities of the state governments. And the state governments saw themselves as leaders of economic development for the states. The states were effectively independent economies competing with one another for shares in the, in the world markets. Uh, and uh, that, that proceeded uh, pretty much until the Second World War when Australia was almost invaded by the Japanese and the states suddenly worried. Uh, they uh, approached the federal government to say, can we have a state allocation of the defence forces? Because if the Japanese are going to invade Australia, we want to be able to defend Western Australia the same way as we defend Tasmania or Queensland. So there was worry when the Japanese were invading how the states would get an equal share or their rightful share of the defence. Um, the states realised that they had to collaborate even more and in the Second World War the states yielded up powers of taxation and so if you like almost uh, 50 years after federation, the state governments agreed that the federal government would actually collect income taxes and company taxes. But that was only collecting the revenue. Um, still within the states at the moment, the individual states of Australia have their own company laws and company regulations and health and safety regulations. So we're not a nation in those terms. So the states saw themselves as the leaders of economic development. And that has continued to this day. And in essence, the development of Australia was really a catalogue 
of state-based development. It was the states that built the water projects. It was the states that built the electricity systems. It, it was the uh, uh, states that approved of mining projects and so on. And it was, of course, the states that built roads. Built roads. This had an unfortunate uh, uh, consequence because the states were not really interested in interstate trade. So as far as roads were concerned, you'll all know that they used to get more pothole the uh, closer you got to the state border. <laughs> and because of the fact that we had states with independent, uh, different rail gauges, there was very little interest in uh, uh, national development of a rail system. So we had the situation where the development of the nation was in the hands of independent state governments. Somebody has referred to them as the warring tribes. <laughs> and and uh, this is what continues to the present day. In the present economic climate, this continuity of state-based development is causing difficulties from the point of view of planning for national development and national security. And what is tending to happen is that the states are moving away from state control of development to development uh, initiated and funded by the private sector. So we have a situation where the state governments are tending to move away from state planning for state development and saying it's from now on it will all be in the hands of the private sector. And of course that still keeps it out of the hands of the federal government. <laughs> and the federal government similarly is not too keen on undertaking national development if it is likely to be opposed by the state governments. And we have an organisation called the Council of Australian Governments, which is where the Prime Minister sits down and faces all the state premiers, and they eyeball one another. <laughs> and of course, you can realise that the states effectively uh, 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 outnumber and, and eyeball stronger. <laughs> and, and to a certain extent, the Council of Australian Governments is the Australian equivalent of Taliban. <laughs> it's an un effectively an unelected group who are determining the direction of the development of the nation. Now, at the end of the Second World War, there were concerns about this development of the nation, and uh, one of the projects that the people had in mind at the time was the Snowy Mountain Scheme. And I was a young engineer on the construction of the, and design, and design particularly, of the Snowy Mountain Scheme. That was, and is, the only national infrastructure project in the history of the nation. <coughs> so in a hundred years of federation, we've only had one national infrastructure project. Now, a few years ago, um, four or five or six years ago, the states were worried that the operations of the Snowy Scheme and the electrical operations of the Snowy Scheme were causing a degree of embarrassment to the privatised electricity in Victoria. What had happened is that the Victorian government had privatised the Victorian electricity system, and they'd got about 50% more money for it than they thought they were going to get. So there was a great uh, increase in the monies available, which the state proudly said they were using it to pay off state debt, and it provided uh, money for uh, hospitals and education. So they effectively sold off the family silver in, in selling off the Victorian electricity system, and uh, from that money they said they were spending it on current consumption. It's a bit like, uh, you know, uh, selling off your built up assets or selling off the farm and just using it for, for current expenditure. It was, a, it was really a, an absolute disgrace. But, but they kept on saying it was necessary for the state government to get out of 
things like electricity and water and so on, and it was being privatised. In order to get that favourable price, the Victorian government, and nobody knew at the time, had entered into long-term agreements uh, to guarantee the price of electricity to these newly new private owners. So the people that bought, bought Lo Yang, for example, had a contract until the year 2012 that guaranteed a price of four cents a kilowatt hour <laughs> uh, to, uh, to the enterprise. Unfortunately, the Snowy Mountain Scheme, who was operating on the, on the rainfall and so on, uh, they were finding that uh, they were able to sell electricity on the national grid, on the market, at prices less than the price that had been guaranteed by the Victorian government. So the Victorian government got most upset about this because in effect the Snowy Mountain Scheme was competing unfairly, they said, with the pri new private uh, electricity system. So the Premiers of New South Wales and Victoria had a bright idea and they got together and arranged for New South Wales, you see, nothing to do with Victoria, to hold an environmental inquiry into the Snowy Scheme and to, in effect, agree to limit the electricity output of the Snowy Scheme by reducing or er, releasing this 28% of the water down the Snowy River. Now, that was done purely for commercial purposes and purely to solve, if you like, the, uh, the problems of the Victorian government in, in uh, underwriting the, the, uh, the electricity prices. The incredible thing is that Victoria and New South Wales and now South Australia and the Feds have agreed that the output of the Snowy Scheme will be uh, reduced by that amount for 75 years. Now, the Snowy uh, Scheme, as you know, is a wonderful scheme and the demand for electricity in Australia and has, has probably increased 20 or 30 fold since the Snowy Scheme uh, was built. <coughs> and so we have a mad situation where they've agreed to curtail the production of electricity from the Snowy, reduce the flow of water to farmers in the Murray-Darling Basin, and all to solve a commercial problem with respect to Loyang and the Portland smelter. Now, my, there are Labor governments in Victoria and New South Wales who see the release of water down the Snowy as a way of getting the environmental vote. Uh, the Federal Coalition only agreed to that because the Federal Coalition doesn't have any, have any powers over electricity. And all the Federal Government powers has in this area is environmental because the federal government has signed the Kyoto thing, <laughs> a few other things, and environmental agreements with the United Nations. So therefore, the federal government said that they've got an environmental interest. But if they had an environmental interest, they would have def defended hydro against thermal. <laughs> and so we've got the mad situation where New South Wales, Victoria, the feds, and now South Australia have all agreed for the, if you like, the closure of part of the diversion of the, of the Snowy into the inland of Australia uh, for the purposes of a reduction of power output. And they're all going to the polls this month. So my advice to the Citizens Electoral Council is that every candidate has to oppose the uh, release of waters down the Snowy River and the return of the Snowy Mountain Scheme to uh, a national ownership. Yes. Now, if you, if you do that, you know that the major parties will be against you and there'll be a large number of people out there who will agree because they've done this for the, if you like, the bleeding heart environmentalists who really don't know what they're doing. And they're <laughs> mainly, and, and I, you see the environmental lobby one of their major concerns was white water rafting down the snowy. <laughs> so I'm just pointing out that should be one of your major uh, planks, the defence of the snowy scheme 
and, and the return of the waters to the farmers. You can talk, uh, my advice is if you can go anywhere in the Murray-Darling Basin and if you say we must return the water to the farmers, you'll get every vote from every farmer. They've got strong feelings about it and the National Party are terribly embarrassed. Okay, let's go back to this chart. Uh, I'm showing you a chart of Australia in relation to our markets. And over here, you can say there are something like almost four billion people. Large number. And we're only uh, tw 20 million. There's a very large number of people there, potential markets for us. And so what we have to think about is that how we do we relate to these markets. In world terms, the distance from Darwin to Singapore is the same distance as uh, the length of the Mediterranean. Now we've got irrigated uh, crops in Israel and Turkey and vessels going across the Mediterranean and, and uh, sending fresh fruit and vegetables into the heart of Europe. Now, this is much the same. So if we can get our produce to Darwin or to Broome, we've got access to markets in the same way as Turkey and Israel and so on have access to European markets. So we've got to think of it in those terms. And it means, as I'm going to point out to you, going up market in the products uh, we uh, provide. Um, where's that thing? Over here. This one now? Yeah, the bottom one. Bottom one. Now, this is a slide showing the large container ports of the world. You can see that there is a great concentration in East Asia. There's a concentration in Europe and the east and west coast of America. This concentration in East Asia from Singapore to Tokyo. Where's Melbourne? No, well, it's down there, isn't it? <laughs> that concentration there at any one time has 50%, 50% of the world's container ships, 50% of the world's containers are in that area at any one time. 50% of the world's container ships are in that area at any one time. Now that's a fantastic potential market for us. So if we can get to here, we're within the accessible distance of all of that uh, maritime trade. So, the cities are growing very rapidly, far more rapidly than other parts of the world. And you see, Jakarta is just two or three days sailing away, and these are estimated projections for, say, the year 2015 and the year 2000. In the year 2015, it could be Jakarta alone not Java, Jakarta alone, as a city, could have 21 million people, the same population as Australia. Fantastic market, just, you know, three or four days sailing. And of course there's Shanghai, 23 million, the Greater Tokyo will be 28 by then, and uh, these other places. There's uh, an enormous growth. I was recently in Shanghai a year or so ago, and uh, I have never seen so much construction going on in the same place at the same time. And there are beautiful buildings, and you don't worry or worry about uh, uh, being a poor area and so on. These hard-working Chinese, and the girls in particular, were just in the streets. They all had their mobile phones to their ears. <laughs> now, in effect, China doesn't have to go through the hassle of a wired telecommunication system they're just leaping into the modern era with mobile phones. And, it's, uh, very, and of course they manufacture them themselves and they're churning them out. Now, in economic terms, we have to think about distance and time to market. The state-based development system in Australia was developed on the idea of the tyranny of distance, the long time to market, and we 
grew products and, and, uh, 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 and, and ar agriculture and mining and manufacturing were all directed to the supply to markets at a long way away where time was not important. A, a good example is the wool industry. With the wool industry, it really doesn't matter how long it takes for the product to get to market. And in fact, we had a wool stockpile that lasted for three or four years. Uh, wheat, similarly, is what you'd call a tyranny, a distance crop. And so uh, uh, canned fruits and, and so on, tyranny, a distance crop. Dried fruits, tyranny, a distance crops. So our whole system of agriculture uh, developed on the basis of a long time to market. Now we're in an era uh, where people are interested in, uh, uh, if you like, fast foods, shelf life foods. Um, uh, time to market is critical and Australia has to rethink the sort of things we do. If we continue to think that it's only worthwhile growing <coughs> foods and crops <coughs> that might take six months to market, everybody else around the world is, uh, is going to be trying to do us out of business. So we have to lift our game and think about how we are going to in shorten the time to market. And that means money. And it, as I point out, it also means a different type of thing. We can move from grains and grazing, canned and dried fruit, to intensive horticulture, shelf life foods, if we shorten the time to market. Now, the system that we had, have, and I'm showing a map of Australia showing the different states, their separate ports and rail systems. Victoria had their own port and the green rail system. Uh, 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 broad gauge. Uh, Queensland, <coughs> Brisbane port <coughs> and narrow gauge. Uh, Western Australia, a port with narrow gauge and, and in New South Wales, standard gauge. And uh, if you like, for the first 50 years or so in Australia, it really didn't matter because nobody was really interested in trade across straight borders. And when the Constitution was written, you know, they had customs houses along the Murray there at, you know, Wodonga and Echuki can go to Echuki now and see the old customs house where there are customs. If you're coming from New South Wales, you have to go through the customs shed. So that was the system that operated. And so, from 1850 to 1900, there were state economies and the rail and port systems were planned to serve state trade with Europe. There were different gauges and it didn't matter. With the Constitution, the states retained the powers for public works. But since then, in the last hundred years, we've had all sorts of new changes. And I've brought in road transport. The fact was, when the Constitution of Australia was written, Motorised road transport was not invented. In the year 1900, motorised road transport was not invented. So this is an entirely new thing and we have coped with it to date on the basis of state roads, not national roads. Similarly, electricity was just appearing. Irrigation came mainly after the turn of the century. We now have trade with Asia rather than trade with Europe. Containerization and globalization. And here we have one other problem. In this world of globalization, how do you like the idea of the separate state economies trading with the world and competing with one another in trying to trade with the world? <laughs> now, I have referred in one of my papers to a situation where the chief minister of the Northern Territory uh, flew to Beijing and, and signed a memorandum of understanding with the Premier of China. How do you like the idea of a clown like the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory sitting down very seriously with the Chinese and signing a memorandum of understanding for, sta for Northern Territory development and trade? Terrifying, isn't it? And of course, if the feds tried to find out, they'd, they'd be politely told to mind their own business. <laughs> okay. Hey, did I lump? There we are, right. Now, 
in the last hundred years, uh, Australia has been changing. And the idea of trying to keep uh, the states developing equally is not working out very well. And so, in this chart, I'm showing the market share ratio of the changing distribution of population, gross state product, and electricity consumption. Now, I want to point out to you, in effect, that there is a newer industrial Australia, Queensland and Western Australia and the Northern Territory, the population are voting with their feet, and the gross trade products are moving that way. And you can see that these are mirror images of the same thing. And electricity consumption is increasing. So you can see the way electricity consumption is a leading indicator of uh, the state development. So in effect, we have newer industrial Australia, older industrial Australia, and it is now a task of national management to integrate it more effectively. How do we integrate older industrial Australia so that it can work together with newer Australia? And that's what I'll show you in the next slide. And this is one of the things I want to do. I want to make sure that these new mineral and mining developments over here are, uh, um, and great steel mills are being proposed along the uh, uh, coast of Western Australia based on the iron ore and the abundant supplies of natural gas in the Timor Sea. And so we're seeing the prospect <coughs> of major steel industries on the west coast of Western Australia. The way they're going ahead with it, they are just not interested in the rest of Australia. They just see this as an opportunity to develop trade with the world and they're dealing with the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Chinese and others and getting on with the job. So if we're going to have Australian enterprises taking part in those jobs, we've got to build the infrastructure to, to uh, make that integration possible. The way these projects are now going ahead, within the mining industry, for example, Worldwide, they now have a buying cartel, effectively, to purchase bits and pieces for uh, the mining sector, the, uh, the big transports they use, and, and the mining equipment. And uh, they, in effect, call tenders on a world basis, and people tender over the internet. So Western mining uh, 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 wants a whole uh, bunch of new bulldozers or something like that, they tender on the internet. Uh, and so, and, and all the major mining companies are in it, BHP, uh, Western Mining, Rio Tinto, and they have their preferred suppliers. And some of my Melbourne manufacturing friends were telling me the other day, they've looked at this list of preferred suppliers for all of these major mining companies in Australia and around the world, and there is not one Australian company on the list of preferred suppliers. So in effect, we're being shut out, and somehow or other we have to assert our interest and assert our capability, and this is one of the things I'd like to do. And we start building a few things in Australia that, that focus attention on Australian potential. Now, I've tried to suggest various uh, ways of doing it, consistent with the federal government's view about uh, <coughs> privatisation. And I've suggested, well, if you're going to go down that track, here's one private railroad you could build, and here's another one over here, and of course the, this one's going ahead now uh, with the uh, uh, connection to Darwin from, uh, uh, from Adelaide. Now I've suggested they're the sort of things that could be done. I know from my discussions with the industry if tenders were called for that, or invitations to expressions of interest, there'd be absolutely no trouble in getting the money to build it. Now, there's all sorts of reasons for that. One of the problems is that the great superannuation system in Australia, for the last hundred years, has been finding capital for Australia's infrastructure. Do you remember the SEC loans and the Border Works loans and all of those? And, and the superannuation funds were absolutely delighted 
to have a proportion of their money in government guaranteed infrastructure. And that was security uh, for the super funds. Now they've been told that all of that uh, infrastructure is going to be in the private sector and the superannuation funds have had their money returned to them effectively and they've had to invest it in the stock market. Well, in the present state of the stock market, the super funds are absolutely petrified. <laughs> and so the super, super funds are saying to me, Lance, if you can go ahead with that, we will guarantee to find all the money. So, okay, why, if it looks so good and if the money's available, why doesn't it proceed? And one of the reasons is that Queensland have told me, in no uncertain terms, uh, that they are absolutely opposed to any rail link between Mount Isa and Darwin and Mount Isa in the Northern Territory. Because all Queensland freight, according to the Queensland government, has to go out via Queensland ports and go on the Queensland rail system and there's no way they want a standard gauge rail going through there when the Queensland system is three foot six. But they've said, if you go this way through Brisbane and all the way and you make all of that standard gauge, we'd let you do that. So in other words, if you're prepared to reconstruct the entire Queensland network, the standard gauge, that lets you make a connection to Darwin, but not, not anything going through there like that. The New South Wales government have told me they would never agree to a rail connection north and south like that through New South Wales because all New South Wales freight has to go out by the ports of Sydney and Newcastle and has to use New South Wales rail. The government of Victoria have told me this is absolutely absurd because Melbourne is the logical central port for Australian trade with the world. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the Western Australians say there's no point in going to Darwin, you might as well go to Perth. So everybody's got their own little interest and nobody's prepared to look at it on a national basis. Right. But you see, these are the sort of things we could do. The Murray-Darling Basin now supports eight and a half billion dollars of agriculture per annum is growing up and manufacturing based on agriculture of that, leading to a total of 20. And they've got, say, 1.8 million people. There's probably 2 million people now. And it connects all these irrigation systems. Now, those irrigation systems at the moment are mainly based on tyranny of distance crops. And so if we provide the rail system, all of a sudden we change the value of land and the value of water because the farmers use the water for different purposes. It's to a certain extent it's starting to happen at, at the moment uh, with the wine industry. The wine industry is buying some of these uh, uh, water rights and land and converting it to grapes and making wine for world markets. Here's another rail connection we can make. At the present moment, the east-west rail connection from Sydney to Perth goes through Broken Hill. Now, as you can see, all of that's just desert through there, nothing at all. But the green here, what I've coloured in green are the irrigation channels. And you can see the areas of irrigation. And that bit there is missing. So if we constructed just the section from Hay to Oyen, we'd have a rail connection between Sydney and Adelaide, which would go through the uh, a fair part of the irrigation areas in the Murray-Darling Basin. That's, that's something we can do. It's relatively inexpensive. It, it involves New South Wales, uh, Victoria, and South Australia. And somebody's told me there's absolutely no way <laughs> that project will ever proceed. But it's logical. Now, I've also been, I'm going to show you something on the uh, Great Australian uh, Artesian Basin later on. I'm looking at pipelines. I've been up here prowling around those dam sites, and I'll show you that later. There are possibilities of bringing water down and great areas of irrigation in there and if we've got a railroad system going from Melbourne to Darwin past this area, this project becomes highly economic. And uh, 
the Queensland government and I have differences on several matters. <coughs> uh, and here's an example of the, what I can do on the inland diversion of the currents. Now, th there's a problem here in that the, what I'm looking at on, this, on the western, on the, on the inland side, is that the best place to put the water is down the McIntyre, which forms the border between New South Wales and Queensland. And the New South Wales government have said to me, that's good New South Wales water, and if it goes over the divide, there's no way they're going to share it with Queensland. <laughs> Right, and here's a proposed railway in Western Australia going through all of the mining areas here. There are railroads up there, but the important thing is that when the Hammersley and the uh, iron ore export developments are going ahead up there, the Western Australian government entered into an agreement with uh, Rio Tinto and others that the railroads that were there uh, were, could be operated as private railroads, they would not be expected to be common carrier railroads, and there'd be no competition. And if anybody else wanted to compete with them, they had to build their own railroad. So along comes Muggins. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to build a railroad from there to there. And I am finding that even the Western Australian government is embarrassed because they've guaranteed to the two or three mines up there, particularly Rio Tinto, that there'd be no competition from a private sector railroad. And of course, I know that if that went ahead, a lot of these mines around here would be wanting to export to the world and develop processing plants and everything else. So this area would go ahead, but at the moment, the agreements with some of the big time players are dominating the scene. And uh, I've been up in the, in the uh, Kimberley and looking at the Ord and the Victoria River. And when I was up there, they provided me with an aircraft so I could fly all over these areas and, and, and look them out. There is expansion here of the Ord irrigation system. There's enormous potential there and a potential dam site here on the Victoria River. The if, if the Ord and the Victoria are operated as an integrated development, there is fantastic potential to develop vast areas under irrigation with guaranteed water supplies. And the monsoons come every year and there's ample monsoon water for these irrigation projects. Once again, the problem is access to markets. And when I was up here, I was having a chat to the guys who are trying to get their produce to the market in Melbourne. And they are driving triples, you know the triples? Yeah. They're driving triples and they're loading up here and they're heading all the way to Melbourne. They don't quite get to Melbourne because they have to disentangle themselves as they cross the border. But um, they're heading to Vic markets in Victoria and New South Wales. You can imagine that if we could connect that to the a railroad that's now heading to Darwin from Alice Springs, we could get the Ord and the Victoria irrigation projects uh, connected with southern markets. That would in increase their market. And at the same time, this area then become a market for our temperate crops and vegetables. And we could support a very large population up there. We could even put Afghanis up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so there are things like uh, we could have feedlots. One of the things about our uh, cattle industry is that there are problems from time to time in the way the crops, uh, the fodder crops grow in various parts of Australia. If we could have an integrated system with a road and a rail system here, we could have feedlots in different areas and places for export. And the, the good thing about that is that because of the variability of cli climate, what happens in Australia, particularly with the monsoon rains, it doesn't necessarily mean that we always, we have a drought all over Australia at the one time. And if you chat to people in the, 
in, 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 the ag in the farming game, they're always aware that there are parts of Australia where there are good rains and there are parts of Australia which are in drought and, and but it, never at any one time do you have an in, a national drought. There's always water and fodder somewhere. And the idea is that we can keep our, our uh, cattle industry and, and some of the other uh, animal industries like pork and so on, we can keep them moving if we have the internal transport systems uh, to move animals and fodder. So I'm proposing roads. I'm finding once again in talking about this, I have opposition from the Queensland government. And if you have a look at the Queensland road system, you find it always goes this way. Because the, they're always taking their, their, their products to the Queensland coast. Right, so okay, these are the market opportunities. We have to replace the tyranny of distance with the challenge of time. We have to serve growing populations. You've seen the growing populations in Asia. Growing markets. And develop new products for new markets. Okay, let's have a look at some of the constraints and opportunities. Now, in all of your work in, in standing for election, here's just a little piece of information to remember because it focuses the attention of people. The world population is growing at the rate of one Australia every three months. Can you comprehend what that means? One Australia every three months. That's the growth in the world population. The population in Asia, which is very close to Australia, is growing at the rate of one Australia every six months. Now that's, uh, no, that's a pretty serious amount on it. I'm, I'm having my picture taken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, don't stop. Don't stop, okay. Well anyway, population in Asia is growing at the rate of one Australia every six months. Now that's an enormous market for us. It's also an enormous challenge. Because whether we like it or not, we have to compete. And I want you to think of the young people in these countries being educated, upwardly mobile, conscientious, hard working. The young people in these countries, uh, you know, at 10 and 11 and 12, they're all expected to do their jobs around the household and some of them are actually going to work. Uh, they're studying and working. They're keeping their heads down. And uh, you know, when I was Dean of Engineering, I used to see it, look at a sea of Asian faces. So there are keen, capable young people in these, in these populations, and they are a challenge to our young people. And at the moment, uh, our young people tend to be dropping out. We have the highest suicide rate in Australia, in the world for young men. And so we've got this, and our own young people feel that there's no hope. So think about this, it must be part of our policy. And part of your major program, if you're standing for election, is to create hope and opportunities, or opportunities and hope for the young people of Australia. And I'd suggest to you the two major parties are not doing that. Don't think that the growth of population in Asia down in the world that they're a bunch of peasants. It's not like that anymore. And uh, I want you to think about the industrialization of Australia, the sophistication of Australia, I want you to think about, say, all of Melbourne uh, in terms of our industries and, and so on, our capability and people, all of the uh, electricity we generate, the lights in all of the buildings and in houses, the factories grinding away all over Australia. And so I want you to think of Australia as one giant factory 
Australia is one giant factory with people working and producing goods and living and acting and so on. So Australia is one giant factory churning away. And now I want you to think about the way the world is growing. I've already told you that the world population is growing at the rate of one Australia every three months. And so I want you to think about how does the world as a whole, how does that grow in relation to Australia Incorporated? Australia is a giant factory. And let me tell you, the world is adding one Australia every six months. Can you comprehend that? Everything you see out the windows here in Melbourne, all over Melbourne, all over Sydney, Brisbane, all the rest of it, all of that sort of development and building and electricity and factories and everything else, the world is adding that once every six months. So there's a huge demand there, there are huge opportunities. There's an absolutely enormous challenge. And there's no way Australia is going to be able to continue the way it is unless we recognise the enormity of the competition from these areas. Now, somehow or other, we've got to mobilise our youth and our people to say, look, it's a very serious world and Australia is going to have to earn its living in the world rather than just borrowing on everybody else and trying to fund it from borrowing. Right. So these are the global changes in the last 20 years. The growth of industrial production in poor countries. Decline of industrial production in the rich countries. We've actually been in America, for example, their industrial production has been declining and more and more of their industrial needs are being met by imports. This recent attack on the World uh, Trade Center has revealed the vulnerability of the US economy because they are totally dependent on imports and totally dependent on the supply, if you like, of money uh, from around the world to continue to prop up the US stock market. So we've had a growth of industrial production in poor countries, a decline in rich countries. The appearance of prosperity in the rich countries has been sustained by the creation of credit to a vast extent, or by devaluation in Australia. There are consequent excessive stock market valuations. And I didn't need the attack on the World Trade Center to tell me that. <laughs> There's an emphasis on quick returns. There's a growth of global corporations and there's a growth of global speculation. So you have to live with this as reality. Remember the names of some of these banks. Chase Manhattan and J.P. Morgan banks each have more committed in speculative bets than the GDP of USA. Mm -hmm. It is quite possible that before the next six months are out, with the ripple effects of the attack on the World Trade Center and the collapse of some of the economies, that some major insurance corporations worldwide are going to hit the dust and some major banking groups and Chase Manhattan and JP Morgan and I suspect uh, that these guys at the moment are trying to bluff their way through and I think there's going to be some pretty uh, serious changes worldwide and this is going to have an enormous ripple effect on their own stock market. So, getting back to Australia. The Constitution makes no reference to public works. So, so what are we going to do about that? And one of the problems is that they've been saying that the state-based rail is sufficient. But if you were a farmer moving goods, now if you were, say, 600 kilometres away from Melbourne in the Riverina and you were, say, growing potatoes or something like that, would you put them on the rail or just put them on the back of a truck and take them down to the Melbourne market? Truck. Truck, right. Truck yes. And you don't, have, uh, you don't have a problem of using the truck to take it to the rail <laughs> or using the, uh, at the other end. Yeah, absolutely. So... The economic break-even point between road and rail transport is about a thousand kilometres or more. But virtually all of the state 
based rail systems are less than that. So there is really no economic reason for the state based rail system. There's only an economic reason for the state systems if they are integrated with a national haul. So rail is long haul and the short rail just in, if you like, around Australia is only effective if it is integrated with long haul rail. But one of the problems is that uh, I'm going to get on to management now because being candidates and going for election are going to be in the position where you're going to manage something. So have a look. Now, this is, say, the normal way companies operate. Uh, even BHP. <laughs> and, uh, but they have a head office and divisions and that's the normal organisation chart. You, you, that's the way you think of it. How is Australia organised? What's the organisation chart for Australia? Oh, well, here they are. <laughs> here they are. The sovereign states, the warring tribes. They're in charge. And, they're, and, and as I point out, uh, they have their own global representatives. Let me tell you about the beginning of the United Nations just after the war, remember? And so the world was going to create the United Nations. What did New South Wales do? They sent a delegation to New York, or to wherever it was, to plead the case for New South Wales to be a member of the United Nations. <laughs> and they were saying that they were the sovereign states and the federal government only had limited powers. And the, and the Australian government had to work terribly hard to get the people on the other side of the world to say no to New South Wales. But they meant business. And they still do. You've got to remember the decision to throw water down the uh, Snowy River is state rights triumphant. They have told the feds, no matter what you say or do, we're in charge. And if the Snowy competes unfairly with our electricity, watch out. But here's the Australian government, you see. Their powers are only allocated by the constitutional referendum. But fortunately, the Australian government were given powers to enter into international agreements. So they go over here and they enter international treaties with the UN and one of them is the environment. So all of a sudden the Australian government have powers over the environment. And that's the reason why you see some of these things happening. And the state governments are terribly worried. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the state governments are worried that the feds are going to do more of that. Hmm? If I go to the next slide, I might disappear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's happening? I can't move. Oh dear. There we are. Now that's a. Uh, that's a digital elevation model. One of the wonderful things about this, all this satellite stuff, I'm going to get onto it later. These days we can get these wonderful maps based on digital elevations. What they do is that they can measure the height of the land to about a meter and then they can color it all different colors. And so oh, I've got 256 colors on this. <laughs> so it means I can have access to uh, 256 different contour levels. You get the idea? And so on some of the work I've been doing on looking at ra railroads and so on, the data is already there. Now many years ago when I was working on the snowy scheme, we had to send out the surveyors to plod through the bush and, and through the snow and everything else and looking through the odd lights. We can just get so much data so readily these days. So it makes the prospects and the design of national projects so easy. If you decided to do something, you can get on with it straight away. So, you must, in your standing as candidates, recognise the economic consequences of the Constitution. The concept of separate and competing state economies is locked into the Constitution, but it's a relic. From now on, the nation as a whole faces the challenges of competing in a world economy. 
In the meantime, the states are abandoning responsibility for state infrastructure and are liquidating public utilities and public assets. In other words, the states are getting out of the game. But they are saying the feds are not in the game, it's the private sector from now on. And with a coalition federal government, they're happy to go along with it. But even the Keating and Company, they were terribly keen on privatisation. And I'm going to show you a bit more of that at, at later. But the Constitution imposes a great burden of costs. The repeated duplication of activity from state to state, between the states, leads to excess costs. And it's tens of billions of dollars a year. <laughs> right. Well, we could be doing other things. The Constitution is a fashionable relic. We just can't afford to go down that track. And if you get on with what I want to do, we're going to be short of people. We're going to need those Afghans. <laughs> and uh, so what's been happening over the last 50 years? Here's 1950. That's when I started work in the Snowy Scheme. And, and here we are today, 50 years later. Production as a percentage of the Australian economy production, the total of rural mining and manufacturing has been going down. Manufacturing is going down, rural is going down, mining has kicked up a bit. Services, and you know, they keep on saying, oh, we're becoming a service economy. You know, you've got to think about that. If we all take in one another's washing, what on earth are we going to do in a global economy? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's, services are growing, that's going down. Now, the GDP is growing at 4.3%. Remember Costello saying, oh, GDP is growing. You know, everything's, the Australian economy is in fine shape. Of course it's in fine shape, because they're all working in services. <laughs> you see, production might be going down the gurgler, and, 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 uh, and so services... So the, the growth in the gross domestic product, the growth is in services, not in real work. Our trade depends on our production. Everything that leaves our shores and, or comes in, goods, depends on production. Our production and exports are insufficient to pay the bills. So our trade is insufficient to pay the bills to afford all these people going into services. Our external liabilities are growing at the rate of 7.9% per annum, or well, they were when I wrote this. So we say the economy is growing, but it's being funded by our increasing external liabilities. The difference between those two is minus 3.6, is the rate at which our debts are expanding faster than we can pay them. So one of the things you've got to do when you come in as, can as, as elected representatives, somehow or other you've got to get Australia to pay its way in the world. We just can't carry on like this. And the national overhead as a percentage of production. Now, if you think of yourselves as, as say, uh, running a factory and you're selling to the world and you've got uh, a few office girls and a few people there and, and, they're, and they're the overhead. Now, the guys working on the factory floor are getting on with the production and, and the manager and the people in the office are the overhead. Now, you have to fund the overhead by the surplus of profit from the production. In other words, you produce the goods at such a low price compared to say, you sell them on the marketplace and the money you make helps you to pay for the people in the office. And that's what Australia should be doing. We should be doing that. But what's been happening in national terms, and here's 50 years ago when I was with the Snowy, the overhead, say the people in the office, was something like about 70% uh, of the uh, people on the factory floor. The farmers and the miners and the manufacturers and all the wealth they were making. So in terms of the wealth, the production of our farms, mines and factories was enabling us to support an overhead of 70% of the income from farms, mines and factories. It's now 
And so that is a burden we cannot sustain. And one of the things we're doing is we're quietly devaluing the, the currency and we're pretending we're all busy. <laughs> okay, so here is the fashionable view, and I'm going to get on to fashions later on. If we look at the gross domestic product in current dollars, this is what's been happening. According to Peter Costello and the others, the Australian economy is growing wonderfully well. You get the idea? But down here, the Australian dollar is worth 400 yen, for example, and up here it's worth 60 yen. So you've got to say to yourself, well, okay, we might be kidding ourselves that we're growing well, but how do we compare with our trading partners? How do we compare with Germany or Switzerland or America or Japan? And if we look at it this way, it's not so hot. And so I've tried to look at some of the things we can do. The view from Japan. In Japanese yen, if I plotted the same graph in Japanese yen, this is the sort of thing that's been happening. And since 1980, there hasn't been much happening except just going up and down like a fiddler's elbow. <laughs> and that's just the variation. But you can see the view from outside, Australia is not growing, and our national debt is expanding. Now, if I can, can you go back to the yeah. previous slide? Now, if we go to this, one of the terrible things that's been happening in Australia is that Australia is for sale. Because back here, the Australian dollar is worth 400 yen. But now, it's 60 yen. So Australia's a bargain in world terms. And we're worried about all these firms being bought out and closed down and shut down and all that sort of thing. Terrible. And so, we're in diabolical strife because we're not earning our living in the world, we're dependent on outside monies, and, and Australia is cheap. We're up for sale. So, now, all political candidates for the election must memorise these fashionable views, because <laughs> this is what you're going to con... Okay? Fashionable responses of national... This is what the... Labor Party and the Liberal Party have been doing, there is much less public investment in infrastructure or in maintenance. Long-term planning has been replaced by short-term. You agreed on that one? Okay. Larger allocations for social welfare. Okay. Increased taxes. And taxation measures are becoming a major factor in business decisions and in politics. It's incredible the number of firms that change their business practices in order to meet the prevailing taxation requirements. So tax becomes a major factor in business decisions. It should never be that way at all. There are deficits in government budgets and they accept that in the hope that things are going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's been sale of public assets. But you see the sale of public assets is often just to balance the books. They got themselves into such diabolical financial trouble and debt that the only way forward is to sell the assets. Now, and the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, have both of them have been up to it. And the incredible thing is that there's a whole bunch of bankers and others that cheer them on. Now, they're making a fortune out of the laundering of all that money. <laughs> There's been a reduction in gold reserves, also to balance the books. Encouragement of gambling as a tax resource. Look at the bloody casino down the corner. <laughs> now, encouraged by government as a tax resource. Encouragement of sport as an economic activity, the Colonial <laughs> Stadium. <laughs> okay. Acceptance of popular rather than rigorous education in the schools. Neglect of technical education. That's terribly serious. Whatever happened to all those junior technical schools? Morphing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, when you look at technical education and the problems in the schools, what happened is that the education department in, say, in Victoria, they had a system of technical schools and high schools. 
And the technical schools were effectively shut down and they were all into high schools and comprehensive schools. That meant there was virtually no trade training at all for boys in particular. And so we have a terrifying situation where the boys and the girls, in, if you like, in uh, co-education, the reality is that there's an enormous difference between a boy of 16 and a girl of 16. They're entirely different people. And the girls are two or three years more mature than the boys at the same age. No, no, well, I, you see, I used to notice this at the university, and uh, the, the uh, students that used to come to us, they grew up with us, and the boys in particular now. And so we've got a terrible situation where the boys in the high schools are dropping out, sitting at the back of class, not taking any interest at all. The curricula has been heading towards the girls. And the boys don't do any of the things the boys like to do. So we have the boys effectively dropping out of the system in huge numbers. It's made worse by the fact that there are a large number of children of single mums in the schools these days. So it means that the boys in those families don't have any male, male role models. So there's an enormous problem amongst the boys in the system and they are the ones that are now starting to take their lives and getting into drugs and everything else. So somehow or other we have to focus a bit more, a lot more, on what we're going to do about the education of in particular young men as well as the young ladies and one of the things we've got to do is to get back to the idea of technical education and we'd give a lot now that should be one of your major planks the revival of technical education for young people now I've got to, I'm for my sins my uh, one of one of uh, one of my characteristics I've learnt in my old age is, is that I uh, have a capacity to enjoy a rude story. <laughs> and, and, uh, and because of that, I found myself president of a club of Melbourne engineering manufacturers, you see, because I laugh at their jokes. Uh, but anyway, I'm president of this club of engineering manufacturers. And they have been telling me there are, first of all, they can't get apprentices. And they're also telling me that there's an enormous difference between the northern suburbs around here, for example, and the eastern suburbs as far as staffing, as young people and technical education is concerned. They, all of, the, all, of the, all of the engineering firms in my group in the northern suburbs and western suburbs, not one of them is employing an apprentice. Apprentices are a dead loss and it doesn't work. And the only firms that are employing apprentices are a few in the eastern suburbs, and they're uh, working through Box Hill TAFE. And most of the TAFE around here and the technical education in the northern and western suburbs is, is virtually folded. So it's something you've got to look at. It's enormously serious. And because of the dominance of the education department, by women, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> because of the dominance of women and women's interest in the education department, they think they're doing the work of the Lord in providing all these opportunities for girls and changing the curriculum for girls. They have effectively signed the death warrant for a large number of young men. And, and so it's uh, something you've got to look at uh, terribly carefully. Mm -hmm. Problems with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, uh, uh, can I declare another matter? My wife. <laughs> My wife is convener of an international status for women committee. And I was recently in Ottawa as an accompanying person. <laughs> and she was elected uh, con international convener. So she has to go to Geneva every now and again. And she's got her... Uh, women from about seven countries on her committee. And she's worried about the status of women worldwide. She's finding that the feminist movement in Australia is a huge embarrassment. 
because they're looking at such things as, say, the problem of AIDS in Africa, where over 50% of the new cases of AIDS are women. Children are being born with AIDS. And uh, there, there are uh, problems in some of the uh, Muslim countries. Afghanistan is a good example where they shoot the women. And so she is finding that she's in a position where she's having to negotiate and, and her representatives around the world negotiate with governments. And the last thing they want to have in negotiation with governments is uh, reference to some of the, if you like, outrageous feminists in Australia. And head of an international committee for, for the status of women. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next one. And so, this is what's happened. Public expenditure, long-term planning replaced by that. And so, we've thrown in the towel. Now, you've got to remember that outfits like, remember the State Rivers and Water Supply Commission in Victoria and the others? They used to keep their records of all the water used in irrigation and so on. SEC used to keep data. They were all part of the game was the long-term planning for the future. I was in the Hydroelectric Commission in Tasmania. And uh, we knew where we were going 15 years ahead. And, you know, we had it all planned out. and was all part of a strategic development. The same applied here in Victoria. I wanted to find out uh, something recently uh, about the SEC and some of the early planning for hydro projects in Victoria. And I found that the records had been deliberately destroyed. No, as a percentage of GDP. Oh, ja okay. Just as a percentage. That's all it is. Hmm. But the records had been uh, destroyed. And uh, this was all part of the act. They wanted a clean break. They got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, another thing. You're going to be asked about native title. So understand the economic background to native title. This is the structure of the Aboriginal population in 1996. And you can imagine what Keating was like when he got this information. And you've got to see the fact that the Aboriginal community are the fastest growing ethnic group in Australia. The Aboriginal community have huge numbers of young people. And if you look at this from the point of view of the Federal Treasury, and this is the sort of thing that Keating asked the Federal Treasury, well here we are, here's the break, here's, here's where they enter the, uh, enter the list for social welfare in Australia. So if, if the bulk, bulk of the people above there, bulk of the Aboriginal community above there are in the hands of the Social Welfare Department, and uh, there it is there, what's going to happen when this lot grow up to those ages? So they realised that the federal allocation for social welfare for the Aborigines could double and triple over the next 15 years. Easy. So what the hell could you do about it? Native title. By bringing in native title, you are able to allow the Aborigines to move away from social welfare because you'd give them the legal right to land and they could charge others rent for the use of the land. So the Keating idea was that if you creative nat created native title and gave access to the land, the Aborigines were then able to derive their own income <coughs> uh, from charging rent for others for the use of that land. And I was speaking to somebody from the Federal Taxation Department in Ottawa, as a matter of fact, and I said, what are you going to do about taxation? <laughs> and they said, we're still working on it. <laughs> but there's an enormous problem. But basically, native title was invented to give Aborigines a source of income. OK? All right, let's look at the next bit. So the net result of that was, this is we, I think this is one of your charts, isn't it? <laughs> OK. Well, I, I added the colour. <laughs> anyway, they're the, they're the native uh, title claims around Australia. 
and, uh, and they're showing the mineral sites and all the little black dots are the mineral sites. So you can imagine what's happening when you claim native title. <laughs> Look at all this around Mount Isa. <laughs> so native title has been claimed and there's all the mineral sites. Well, the net result of that is that mineral exploration has just gone flat. It just died overnight. And so it's had an enormous impact on virtually shutting down a lot of the uh, mineral exploration and development in Australia. One of the sad things, and I think uh, Craig will recognise this, there's a little outfit called Rio Tinto. <laughs> and Rio Tinto, believe it or not, have been providing money to the Aborigines. Yeah. They were a great benefactor. Yeah. And providing money to the Aborigines to fight all these native title cases. But what they're effectively doing is shutting out <laughs> virtually all of these little mines around Australia. So they're giving money to the Aboriginals to screw the Australian mining industry. Get rid of the competition. You've got to think about that terribly seriously. So okay, but where do all, where, if they are the claims for native title, where do the Aborigines live? Sorry. Here they are. They live in the cities. <laughs> so, so here we have native title for the Aborigines, an income out there in the, uh, in, in the bush from the uh, allowing mining companies and others to use their land. And who are the beneficiaries? They're all here in the Labor electorates. <laughs> now, can you imagine the enormity of the problem there? How is how are Howard and Keating or Howard and Beasley going to solve that problem? There's, there, all the bleeding hearts in the world, they're, they're all, all saying these poor Aborigines, but not one of them can understand the enormity of the economic problem we've created. And it's not going to go away and it's going to get worse. Somehow or other we have to find ways of unlocking it. And uh, if you're game enough to say it, <coughs> my first plank on the policy in relation to Asian title would be uh, to repeal the act. <laughs> okay. Let's just now look, we're, we're, we're getting around to your policies. Proposed national objective. This is what you're going to be talking about. Economic and social development of the nation to defend the national interest in a competitive global economy. Not state versus state, or state versus a nation, or states versus a global economy. Let's work together. There are common national problems and national solutions. So let me take you through a bunch of national solutions before we break for morning or afternoon coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Section 92 of the Constitution provides that trade and commerce between states shall be absolutely free. That should provide sufficient legal basis for many ne much needed reforms. In other words, if we believe in that, there's a lot that follows from it. You only have to talk to Alan Fells about it. He's embarrassed by what the states are doing. What is lacking is the will to act and a deliberate restriction or absence of professional competence at the national level. The important thing is that the federal government wouldn't even dare appoint experts in, uh, say, electricity or water or roads or anything else like that. It's a management thing, you see. You don't want professional or technical expertise. So they stay out of it, quite deliberately so they don't offend the states. So, propose new responsibility. You're going to have to memorise these now, so fortunately you've got a copy. <laughs> we should have national company laws. There's absolutely no reason why we should have separate company laws in every state in Australia. I mean, we're supposed to be a national economy. And, and, uh, and the, and the, uh, public companies and others, they shop around for the best states uh, in which they handle their various legal affairs. <laughs> so we should have national company laws and business regulations, national health and safety regulations. Why should every state have their own health and safety regs? National occupation health and safety laws and regulations. National criminal code. Is it too much to ask for a national criminal code? Okay. National electricity regulation. Gas, oil. Return Snowy Mountain Scheme to public national ownership and management. 
planning for national energy security, create a national energy authority. These are the things we can do. Make it part of your platform. <coughs> national planning for water conservation and development. Create a new public authority for the integrated management, protection and sustainable development of the Murray-Darling Basin together with the Great Artesian Basin. The Murray-Darling Basin at the moment is just incredibly muddled management. It's just a total muddle. Mm -hmm. And the states are fighting one another and, and they uh, can't agree on any rational plan of overall management and strategic development of the Murray-Darling Basin. I am pointing out that with proper development we could reconstruct the irrigation works in the Murray-Darling Basin where we could double, at least double, the area under irrigation, double the output for the present volume of water. At the present moment uh, there's an enormous waste of water, the seepage from channels and all the rest of it. By having new diversion canals uh, new, uh, uh, new um, laterals to the farmers in pipe distribution and things like that. We've all got plastic pipes. It's going to cost billions of dollars. But for, in comparative terms, if the, if the total value of output of the Murray-Darling Basin is $20 billion a year, and if for the expenditure of, say, 4 or $5 billion dollars, we could double the output. It's enormously economic. So we've just got to put these things into perspective. There is an enormous potential to double the value of output of the Murray-Darling Basin. Road transport. Planning, funding and building a national road system for interstate and overseas trade. States don't like that. Development of roads for national development. We can get on with it. Rail a national rail system, inviting proposals to fund and build new railways to operate. I know, that, I know the, the money's there and the companies want to do it, it's the states that oppose it. Planning and funding new projects for national development. A national construction authority, the Snowy was a construction authority, to be responsible for the overall planning and management of national infrastructure uh, up to legislation for action. This requires a small and very competent team. It doesn't require a large bureaucracy. It only requires about 10 or 20 people. Talented, capable people getting on with it. In many cases, the funding design could be in the hands of the private sector. In other words, we want it to be set up so that there are concepts going forward, there's legislation provided, we set it up so we can get on with the job. National pioneer teams, young people, create a National Civil Construction Corps to undertake plan, planning of new development roads and basic civil works. There is so much we can do up north. Create National Pioneer Teams to do the work. Members of the Pioneer Teams to be in the age of 18 to 25 on three-year contracts and to be trained on the job in civil construction and plant operation and maintenance. It would be a wonderful opportunity for young people that you'd be overwhelmed with applications. It's got to be set up. Yeah. You have to be careful they won't, they won't carry the wine to the young age. <laughs> <laughs> In theory, then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, well, there was an awful lot of young people in the Snowy Scheme, and the enthusiasm was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Within an hour, both buildings were a pile of rubble. Now, that was a highly engineered attack. You could have spoken to many people around the world, and structural engineers and others, and if you'd said to them, if we fly an airplane into a building like that, uh, would the building collapse? And they would have all said no. So. We've got to look at what happened, and the people that did that knew uh, that if they took out some of the columns on the outside of the World Trade Center, that that would re uh, remove the support of the floor 
because the World Trade Center, both of those buildings, the major structural elements were actually on the outside of the building in that forest of vertical columns. You know the way, if you look at the photograph of the building, there's a forest of vertical columns going up all the way around, relatively uh, uh, close spaced. That way, they are the structural elements. And then there were clear intervening floors uh, and in the middle was the lift shaft. So you had the lift shafts which were vertically reinforced and strong concrete and you had the structural elements on the outside. And these people knew that if they removed the structural elements on the outside, just in part, in a couple of places, that inevitably the removal of the support would lead to the collapse going upwards from the floors that were attacked. And so each floor would then collapse and fail. And eventually what happened was that the weight on the floors was such that the floors were collapsing while the outside still stood there. So the weight of debris uh, in the, on the inside of the building, the weight of debris on the inside of the building, the weight of debris on the floors was such that the floors just went down and down and down like that. And if you have a look at the, uh, the videos, the television coverage, you find that there was just a sequential collapse. And so, in effect, each floor was just collapsing on the other and going down, and the whole building were collapsing all the way. Now, that required a fair level of intellectual input. Uh, it's useful to remember there was an attack on the World Trade Center a, you know, a few years ago, and that the, these attacks were carefully orchestrated and carefully organized so that they knew what they were doing and they uh, knew the way to attack the building. It is wrong to assume that they are just isolated instances. The sort of intellectual effort that went into the attack on the World Trade Center is such that the people that did it were also aware of the damage they were doing to the United States and the world economy in particular, but to the United States economy. The uh, World Trade Center was a center for uh, much banking and, and so on. Um, it, it also, if you look at it this way, it, it was a highly efficient use of resources because the terrorists in effect lost about 15 people uh, in order to kill 7,000 and to put the US economy into a tailspin. And, and that's a terribly serious thing. I am concerned that there is potential there for much more damage. And uh, it's going to be necessary to take this very carefully from now on. Um, I think it's wrong to assume that all they've got to do is to uh, fly into Afghanistan and take out bin Laden. Uh, they can do that and it may, may not make any change whatsoever. There is a very capable, ruthless organization there. It's uh, diffuse and for all we know there, there could be plots to say drop the Golden Gate Bridge or <laughs> something like that and we're all going to hear it. Um, it is right for Tony Blair to be out there uh, uh, leading a charge at the moment because it would be terribly easy for the sort of things that happened in the World Trade Center to happen in the City of London. You've got to remember that virtually all of the traffic to Heathrow Airport flies over the City of London. It would be no trouble at all to drop a plane into the British Houses of Parliament or Buckingham Palace or the Bank of England. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm just trying to point out that we're, we're not dealing with a bunch of peasants. We're dealing with some sophisticated people who know the world financial system intimately. They know its vulnerable points and, and they are sufficiently well organized that they're, they're, going to, they're not going to be put down by a single attack on somebody like Osama bin Laden. He's already done his job, in his, for all we know, 
he might have a hundred thousand disciples out there ready to stand in his place. So it's a terribly serious matter and we're up against some pretty sophisticated people. So one of the fashions at the moment, and I'm talking about fashions and fallacies now, uh, trying to make sound judgments in a world of uncertainties, fashions and fallacies. <coughs> one of the fallacies at the moment is that if we take out bin Laden, we've taken out the terrorists. It's nothing like that at all. <laughs> it's terribly serious. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll tell you as the slides go on. Professional responsibility is the duty of care. There are always uncertainties in our, in our knowledge of the world, and of ourselves, and those on whom we depend. When matters go wrong, we tend to blame others. Sometimes it's just plain bad luck, but often there are signposts pointing to trouble ahead and which we tend to ignore. And so I want to take you through the signposts to trouble. Fashions and fallacies. Now here's a case of plain bad luck. It was on one of my projects. <laughs> uh, but this welded steel penstock burst pulling apart when accidentally subjected to pressures greater than the maximum design pressure. And so we are rather pleased when we did the sums that it should have failed. <laughs> but it was an embarrassment. And it was due to the sticking of a relief valve and, a, and a, an outage uh, in, in the electricity system. A few things coalesced and led to that. And, uh, but then when we analysed the failure, we found this little fatal flaw. The fatal flaw. And if you can see it, you see the chevron markings there? When something fails, there are these chevron markings that point to the failure on either side. That's where the failure initiated, because there it's the velocity of sound through the, the crack pre uh, propagates at the velocity of sound. And it, and it uh, leaves these chevron markings and points to the crack. Now the important thing about it, that is that that flaw could not have been detected with the technology we had available at the time the penstock was built. In other words, we didn't have ultrasonic detection and stuff like this. So this one got through. We normally tried to avoid that by shearing off. This is a, uh, a shearing effect when, when they guillotine a steel plate. It causes this sort of thing. Normally we used to cut it off and we didn't cut off enough. So that crack could not have been detected with our technology and the penstock blew up. And uh, I was in charge of design of a few projects like this. This is a, a dam in Tasmania. And uh, it was our job to look at similar projects around the world and make sure that our technology was up with the latest in the world. You can see the size of thing. That, that's a man in there, see there? And uh, you see the relative thickness there? That dam is Devil's Gate Dam in Tasmania. Uh, the thickness of that dam relative to the radius of the curvature, uh, that's one and a half eggshells. Is, is, the, is the curvature cycloid? Yes, <coughs> vertical curvature and <laughs> so it's a dome. Cycloidal both ways? Yes, indeed. And uh, just circular curves mainly. And uh, circular curves horizontally. But that's one and a half eggshells. So, you know, we had to make sure we knew what we were doing. Yeah. Highly economic. And then there was a collapse in France. And that arch dam there failed. All of that failed and just marched down the valley and 400 people in the village downstream lost their lives. 512 were killed. So I was promptly sent over there <laughs> and to find out the causes of the failure. <coughs> and I looked at the failure of that and other things. And I found as I went through these various projects that there were the technical solutions the technical reasons why they failed. And here's a landslide in, in Bayonne Dam in Italy. 
and that enormous landslide came down and plopped into the reservoir and the water just piled over the top, 300 foot deep over the top there, and 2,000 people downstream were killed instantly. 1,925 lives, including some of the engineers who were sitting over here trying to film it. Uh, so anyway, I investigated these things and I found, as I went about it, that in the case of the guy slide, it was accelerating. And I found that in all of these things, all of such failures, nature gives a warning. Failures don't suddenly happen. There are always warning signs beforehand. And part of the responsibilities of the professional is to note the warnings and understand them and act on them. And so in the days prior to that slide, and you can see on the curve, it was just quietly accelerating. And when that landslide occurred, at the end it was travelling like an express train, but in creeping down the hill for 160 days prior. Now, how can we sense possible problems ahead? Are there organisational failures, factors? Are there attitudes, personal concerns, unusual happenings, what may indicate the trouble? So as a result of my study of failures, and I was sent away to study failures, I came back and said, there are organisational factors and attitudes which are characteristic of failure situations. And you can see them in many things. First of all, there's the lure of fashion. I'm very serious. We can all recognise fashions in dress, music and art. In, in, uh, and I point out here that young people may become so dominated by fashion that they become quite fanatical in their will to conform to a, a person, a particular item of fashion. How many of you got young daughters? <laughs> okay. Do they become dominant? Are they become fanatical about issues of fashion? <laughs> but you see, the fanaticism is not rational, but it offers opportunities for other people to manipulate them. And you get the idea? Creating fanaticism in the market is at the heart of the fashion industry. The fashion industry is directed towards creating fanaticism about the fashion of the moment. Unfortunately, every one of us <laughs> from our youth carries a baggage of fashionable attitudes. I do. I think problems can be solved by reason. <laughs> Does that explain the suicide bombings? <laughs> That's right. Now, uh, all of us are products of the age in which we grew up. You know, in the 1900s, linen and lace, and the flappers of the 20s and 30s. You get the idea? And, uh, and in the 80s and 90s, power dressing and sportswear, and then there's a rock and roll. You, you <laughs> mods, and, mods and hippies. How many of you are from the mods and hippies? You get the idea? All of you are in this meeting now with fashionable attitudes from your own upbringing. Okay. There are fashions in most fields of human activity, including science, engineering, law and politics. We refer to political correctness, which is a fashion. And our politicians strive to conform. Now both uh, Howard and, and, and Beasley are wonderful examples of political correctness in the way they try to uh, posture in such a way there's a certain attitude and of course they really believe it themselves. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you see, that's accepted and, and the media play the game of political correctness. It is comfortable to be fashionable because we assume that other people are thinking for us. Can you understand that when you're fashionable you don't have to worry you're moving with the crowd. Everybody's doing the same thing, therefore they all must be right. <laughs> but if, you, if you're standing aside from fashion, 
you have to think for yourself. It hurts. <laughs> Not only hurts, you see, as far as the politicians are concerned, they are continuously trying to assess the fashionable attitudes of the moment so that they can be seen to be fashionable. And they want to be elected because they're fashionable. Doesn't mean it's rational or anything like that. They, they, it's fashionable. But you see, if we're fashionable, we, we're unaware of danger. The more fashionable you are, the more vulnerable you are to enormous failure. Do you understand the rationality of that? Okay. Arrogance. Now, one of the consequences of fashion, if you're fashionable and you're leading the fashion and everybody thinks you're a fashionable gent, you become arrogant and you drop your vigilance. Arrogance is insidious and erodes our sensitivity. When we're arrogant, we're totally insensitive people. We believe that everybody loves us. We're absolutely right. We're convinced that what we're doing is politically correct and we don't have to worry about problems. So when we're arrogant, we don't do our homework. We drop our vigilance. Arrogance and fashionable thinking go together. Leaders of fashionable trends are idolised by their ardent followers. Look at Hitler. They all thought he was God Almighty. But it gives them confidence in their capacity to lead. So the more somebody like a Hitler is idolised, the more megalomaniac they become. Arrogant leaders demand obedience and are intolerant of the ideas of others. And you can see it all picking in together there. Sorry to do this to you. <laughs> Muddled management. Muddled management and uncertainty about responsibilities indicates danger. Whenever you can't find out who's in charge, you know that they're heading for disaster. And a good example is some of the things that have been happening in, uh, in the business sector in Australia. Look at them trying to sort out the uh, uh, answer problem. And, 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 and they suddenly were, nobody was in charge. <laughs> no, you know, nobody was in charge. They, they assume that specialist skills are coordinating. They don't. When people are busy doing their own thing, the last thing they want to do is cooperate with anybody else. <laughs> okay, all right. Unity requires each specialist to understand his role in the overall enterprise. So a quality of leadership is making sure that specialists understand one another and understand their role in the entire thing. And that requires a much higher level of intellectual leadership. Now, this is one of the problems. Arrogant people may sense uncertainty and they assume control without authority or responsibility. You know, um, uh, and Brax sees that Ansett's got into trouble, so Brax is moving in to take charge sort of thing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you can't work that way. You require people who know what they're doing. So, uncertainty about responsibilities always indicates danger. And we've had magnificent examples of that. You know, Colesmeyer, uh, Ansett, HIH, all of them. The loss of corporate knowledge. Now, in the case of the privatisation of the electricity utilities in Victoria, one of the deliberate things they did uh, was to destroy the corporate knowledge. They didn't want it. Now, the expertise of a firm is the expertise of the people involved. When people you believe, critical expertise may be lost and failures may follow. Now, a feature of modern business management is the use of staff on short-term contracts and of outsourcing. Now, this is one of the most dangerous things a firm can do. You can end up with a situation where you outsource a lot and nobody knows what's going on. So, a feature of modern business management is the use of staff on short-term contracts. That means no long-term responsibilities. The such firms have no assurance of their own internal expertise 
all their own corporate t knowledge and they may they lack competence to outsource intelligently. In other words, if they haven't got intelligence and understanding in, at, in the middle, they haven't got the brains to outsource intelligently. And I find this out from time to time by somebody will ring me up and say, look, I've got the contract for this tunnel or this particular project somewhere. And I say to them, how the hell did you get it? He said, I know. <laughs> so, so. And so we have these, have these people who have never had a job like it before in their lives. <coughs> they got no real experience. All of a sudden they got a major contract for a major project and they've got it because they were a friend of somebody. <laughs> so such firms are a business risk if they can't do their job intelligently they bring down others with them and that's what's happening with Ansett you see Ansett made a mess of it all and in Ansett going down they're likely to drag other firms with them do not outsource the incompetent that's a <laughs> ignoring warnings and as I pointed out that everything involving natural things almost all causes of cases of failure are preceded by warnings every, almost every time there's warning nature often gives a warning and the same applies in human affairs you have the whistleblower saying oh we shouldn't be doing this zap what happens the whistleblower gets shot it's always worrying when properly considered warnings are ignored it's often a clear sign of impending failure when a whistleblower is threatened or attacked. When a whistleblower is threatened or attacked, it's a warning sign that he's probably right and the organisation's wrong. And it needs investigation. And a top manager doesn't start threatening. A capable manager does not th threaten the whistleblowers with death or destruction. And then there's sportsmanship. You ready? In many engineering, as a noble sport. I've been an engineer all my life and I regard it as a noble sport. The true professional tries to recognise that there are uncertainties. Everything you do is filled with uncertainties. But you have to make your judgement in the light of these uncertainties. So occasional blundering is part of the game. You know, it applies in engineering, politics, medicine, you know. <laughs> Bad luck what happens to you. But <laughs> Occasional blundering is part of the game. The good sportsman is the first to acknowledge his blunders and to thank others for help. The bad sportsman who denies his blunders <laughs> is in the grip of senility, regardless of his age. Okay? Little homilies for you. You don't get these from anybody else in Australia, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, okay. How are we going to apply these lessons now to the responsibilities of government, national and state? How do we recognise all these uncertainties and get on with our jobs? Now I've told you, muddled management. Here's a wonderful example. The constitutional relations in Australia are a good example of muddled management. And when the Prime Minister sits down with all these states glaring at him, it's just like the Taliban. As I've already told you, it's locked into our history. It's a relic. The Constitution is a fashionable relic of a past era. It's fashion. And when you mention the Constitution, people say, oh, it's been working well for 100 years. It hasn't. <laughs> the country's going to the dogs. <laughs> There's an environmental fashion. You must understand this. Environmental activism has become a religion. <laughs> the believers in, envir in the environment are not constrained by the needs for logic or scientific accuracy because their hearts are pure. <laughs> <laughs> All others are judged impure and motivated by vested interests. Okay? Environmental activists feel blessed when they stop anything and do not agree to any rational problem solving on principle. As a result, governments are intimidated. A good example of the feds. There's no common ground for analysis or action. The media stir the pot. The media love these environmental activists. 
The scientists and engineers involved stand silent because they don't want to be accused of impurity or, or lack of faith. But that leaves the field open for the arrogant leaders in the environmental fashion who see the weaknesses and exploit them. Now there are certain members of parliament who I regard as leaders, arrogant leaders of environmental fashion who, who see weaknesses and exploit them. You've got to be ready to block that. And sometimes, somehow or other, you have to make sure that the environment is constrained by the needs of logic and scientific accuracy. Okay. Well, you see, I've been telling you about management. But what will we do when we can no longer perform meaningful work? What will we do? <laughs> okay, let's carry on. That's just a little break in the middle. <laughs> now we're getting serious again. But this, is, this is the last serious homily before lunch, I trust. Is that okay? Okay. All of the present public infrastructure in Australia was planned and funded by governments. Planning was long term. Public enterprises were led by distinguished professionals who showed a sense of public duty. The private sector planned and invested on a long-term basis. Many workers had job security and responded with company loyalty. Okay? Almost all of the present system of community services in Australia was established by people of humanitarian spirit. They were volunteers mostly offering their leadership in a voluntary capacity. Altruism and community responsibility were key factors and people worked together for common purposes. Australia was a team. We had people who devoted their time in a voluntary way to serve the community. We had public enterprises that planned and built for the future and there was a general community view and long-term planning and within the private sector there was company loyalty and obligation of companies to their staff and even the training, apprentices and staff training and things like that. So the whole thing w was working well. Can we go back? The present reality, there's a global growth of the free market economy, now it's the survival of the fittest end of job security and end of company loyalty. Governments don't know what to do. There's an uncertain role of governments. Governments are running scared. They really don't know what to do. The utopian vision by governments, the governments think that the private sector is going to create prosperity for all without the need for government leadership or, or, or contributions. If they stand back and allow the private sector to get on with the job is going to solve all our problems. The private sector will do things for the private sector. Firms do things for companies. The private sector doesn't have any great sense of altruism for the community as a whole. So this is an, a, a stupid view by governments. There's been privatisation of public infrastructure. The public assets have been solved to reduce obligations of governments and to release funds for services. There's an end of government planning for development as if there's no future. That's the present reality. There's less sense of community responsibility. Declining role of charity. Fewer volunteers. You know, some of our voluntary groups like uh, Lions and Apex and all the rest of them, even Rotary, having difficulty in getting members these days because they've got community obligations. End of love and friendship. Do you think our society has lost the capacity to love one another? Yeah. There are a million children in Australia in single parent families. Are those children all loved? Does that worry you? There's end of commitment and obligations to other people. Uh, we, these, these days the young people don't uh, marry, they have relationships, I found out. 
and I've had to work out what on earth is a relationship. And I, well, this is my definition. A relationship is an arrangement for sex without duty of care for one another or duty of care to any children. That's a relationship, you see. Uh, they have women's studies in the universities, over my dead body at Monash, but women's studies in universities as a training for gender war. Do we have a gender war? Yes, we've got a gender war. Is it, is it a worry? End of altruism in the community and in government service. End the scholarship and the love of learning. People don't study to love uh, because of a love of learning these days. There's got to be a dollar at the end of it. So we've seen the end of scholarship. At Monash University when I was there, I, I used to do and have business with my colleagues in chemistry and physics and so on. At Monash University there's now no longer a department of physics. It's been amalgamated with the department of materials engineering because they only had about two or three or four students in final year physics. And students weren't going to the university to study physics anymore. You see, and you speak to the teachers and they say, oh, physics is atom bombs, they want to study environment. <laughs> so we've lost the love of learning. <coughs> okay, what are we going to do? Now the present course is go governments continue to run scared. Will the global private sector meet our needs? End of love and commitment in our society. Reduce role of charity and voluntary service. What's going to happen to us? Will that be destructive of ourselves? This is the present course. How are we going to survive in these circumstances? You've got to come back with answers because you're standing for Parliament. The end. This is what I'd like to do. Australians to work together as a united people. Build a sense of community obligation and service. Now I'm getting back to passions and fallacies. Am I just being old fashioned? <laughs>
uh, water is a state responsibility. <coughs> now, over a hundred years ago, we had Banjo Patterson. Remember Banjo Patterson? Yeah, yeah. remember him well. You remember him well, okay. Uh, and I, uh, and I looked up something that Banjo Patterson put in the bulletin a hundred years ago. And he talked about the stock started dying, the Lord has sent a drought, and their derricks are there in the solid earth, and they're sinking the bores, and the drill is plugging down to a thousand feet of level, but the Lord won't send us water, oh, we'll get it from the devil. We'll get the devil deeper down. Now, engines built in Glasgow, which was normal for the time, this is 1896. Canny Scott, it's marked at 20 horsepower, but we don't know what's going on. Canadian Bill was the driller, which was also a characteristic at the time. Uh, development was proceeding in Australia. We had the Canadians and Americans coming here. The driller was a Canadian. And, and so he's sinking deeper down, we're going deeper down. If we fail to get the water, then it's ruined to the squatter. Here's Banjo Patterson again. But the shaft has started caving and the sinking's very slow. And the yellow rods are bending in the water down below. And the tubes are always jamming. So we've nearly burst the engine and we're sinking deeper down. Although the shaft is caving and the tubes are jamming, we'll fight our way to water. You get the idea? But there's no artesian water, though we've passed 3,000 feet. And the contract, now you've got to remember, 1896, drilling to 3,000 feet, can you imagine? And that's a pretty remarkable achievement, isn't it? So they're down to 3,000 feet, but it must be down below us, and it's down, we've got to go, though she's bumping on the solid rock 4,000 feet below, the solid rock 4,000 feet below. And it's time they hear us knocking on the roof of Satan's dwelling, and they're going deeper down. So they're down 4,000 feet, but hark, the whistle's blowing with a wild, exulting blast, and the boys have had to cheer and they struck the flow at last. And it's rushing up the tubing from 4,000 feet below. So they drilled to 4,000 feet through dry ground till it spouts above the casing and deeper down, flowing in a free, unstinted measure, and it clears away the timber and let the waters run, and so on. For the tortured, thirsty cattle bringing gladness in its going through the droughty days of summer and it's flowing, ever flowing, it's flowing, ever flowing deeper down. So Banjo Patterson in the Song of the Artesian Water talks about the drillers drilling to a depth of 4,000 feet through dry sediments until they struck the water in the solid rock below. Okay, I now turn to Professor John Walter Gregory. Uh, 1864 to 1932, he was head of the Department of Geology in the University of Melbourne from 1899 to 1904, and then went to Glasgow. And Gregory was a quite a remarkable man. He studied in the evening at the London Mechanics Institute. He was appointed assistant geology at the British, British Museum. He, uh, he went to London University, he graduated with first class honours in 1890. One became a Doctor of Science in 1893. He went to field studies in the Rocky Mountains in 1891. And in 1896, he went to Kenya. He studied the glaciers of Mount Kenya and the tectonic features of the Great Rift Valley. And the Great Rift Valley in Kenya these days is known as the Gregory Rift. He published a book on the Great Rift Valley in 1896. And you can see the sort of things he did. So, okay, he was appointed to the University of Melbourne after this career. And the people who interviewed him in London only appointed one person, and that was, uh, only interviewed one person, that was Gregory. So he came to Australia. And this is what Gregory saw when he visited the Great Rift Valley in Kenya in 1896. And he was looking at these lakes and see all the flamingos there and the hot boiling waters. And the question is, where did those hot waters come from? Yeah. And there's Vulcan, you know, deep rift valley, hot boiling waters. And so he studied that and he looked at the associated volcanism. And his book on the Great Rift Valley is quite an outstanding piece of scientific investigation. And so he came to Australia. And then in the year 
1901-102, he took a bunch of students to the dead heart of Australia. And he uh, travelled on camel and, <laughs> and so on. And uh, he studied the flowing wells of Central Australia. And by that time, he was 1896, and when this was published, he had already gone back to Glasgow. And the point, point was, nobody understood him in Australia. But when he went to the uh, Artesian Basin, one of the things he did, he looked at the distribution of the underground temperature gradients, shown by, so he was looking at temperatures, you see? And I've plotted his map, here's the map from his book, and I've added the colour, you see, and that was the sort of thing, he was looking at the hotspots. So Gregory said, 100 years ago, the rocks of the deeper layers of the Earth's crust contain water. The quartz in granite owes its milky whiteness to the abundant minute cavities filled with water. Now you know if you've got an ordinary drinking glass that it is clear. But if you, and that's made of quartz, silicon dioxide. If you see quartz in a reef in, in Bendigo or Ballarat or anywhere like that, always white. And the white is abundant minute cavities of water. So rocks, rocks like granite depend on water for their formation and the water's down there. The vast steam cloud which hangs over active volcanoes is due to the escape of steam. This is what Gregory was saying. And so in his book he said the average increase of temperature below the surface is generally taken as that. Many of the flowing wells in Australia show a much rapid rate. The high temperature indicates that the water's probably come from a much greater depth and uh, than that of the water bearing lake. It is more likely to be plutonic water, which he means water from deep within the crust of the earth, residual waters, rather than meteoric water, which is water from rainfall. So a hundred years ago, Gregory said that the water in the Artesian Basin is from deep within the crust of the earth and has got nothing to do with rainfall. And he said, I emphatically reaffirm that these wells are not maintained by the existing inflow of rainwater and the reasons were the chemical composition H2S associated combustible gases that's methane natural gas was coming up with them they were wasting natural gas for a hundred years they used to collect the natural gas on the top of the bores and then flare it so that the stock could find the borehole you know <laughs> I don't know but they used it for mustering uh, and the temperature indicates the the, and the occurrence of high water pressures. So, okay, volcanic activities. So, Gregory also noticed something else. And that was that here is the Great Artesian Basin, that there are large basalt flows up here, adjacent to the Great Artesian Basin. Basalt's down in here. Great volcanic mounds, and of course all the basalts here in Victoria and here in Tasmania. So this was a great zone of volcanism. And Gregory knew that. Gregory was already connecting these with the basalts in Victoria and noting they were all roughly the same age. He was also noting the mines at Cobar and Broken Hill and Roxby Downs which they knew or in South Australia, Mount Isa. And he was saying that these metalliferous deposits, the the metals are deposit, deposited from uh, hydrothermal solutions, water solutions, sil water silica solutions. And so the metals here are deposit deposits from volcanic type activity deep within the crust, dissolving the metals and then precipitating them in, in, in veins and so on, and all of these. What Gregory didn't know and what I've pointed here is that there's a row the volcanoes out there, 4,000 metres high. Can you understand that? A row of volcanoes, 4,000 metres high. How high is Mount Kosciuszko? 1,500 metres? 1,500 metres. So volcanoes here, 4,000 metres high. But, but they're, it just so happens they're in water that's 6,000 metres deep. <laughs> So you don't, or four and a half thousand metres deep, so you don't see them. But anyway, they're there. And so, here's, just off the coast, there's this great rift valley. 
there's great volcanoes in it. And I'm saying, this is Lance Enderby now, because I've been doing all my own studies, I only discovered Gregory recently, and I'm saying there's r residual volcanic waters. So, okay, that's the interpretation. Let's see what's really happening. Pittman, in 1907, totally disagreed with Gregory, <coughs> government geologist in New South Wales. He said that the view adopted by most American geologists that all underground waters have their origin in rainfall is much to recommend it. Makes it easy. Pittman concluded it may be confidently reaffirmed that the great Australian water bearing basin is a true artesian and that the water in the flowing wells has a source in rainfall rather than deep underground. And that was in 1907. Now that has been the official policy of Queensland and New South Wales for the last hundred years. But the drilling record was different. Uh, I'm just showing here there are 11 bores to 4,000 feet. 50% of the bores were taken to bedrock. The water was in the bedrock. And the same happened in New South Wales. I'll carry on. And so this is the official diagram by the government of Queensland. And this diagram uh, shows that the basin is recharging from rainfall here. And this diagram is copied by every school child in Australia. And it is absolutely wrong. And uh, if, if it was true, where would those recharge areas possibly ah, be? Up on the, on the uh, Great Divide. I'll show you in a minute. And so there's the, the recharge areas. The water's supposed to sink into the ground there and, and go along here. Now, I'm, I'm going to point out to you, just last year now, the Queensland government brought in legislation to proclaim these, overnight, proclaim those recharge areas. And the landholders, the farmers, didn't know anything at all about it until they then got letters uh, telling that their, their farms had been proclaimed as recharge areas for the Great Artesian Basin. So the Queensland government, just last year, as a result of my efforts to prove the contrary, have uh, have uh, brought in legislation to proclaim those recharge areas. Uh, I, I was stupid enough to ask, are they going to put up signs? Because <laughs> 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 the water's supposed to go there, then seep along there, you see. <coughs> and that diagram, that shows it's recharging, you can find it on the, on the uh, website of the Queensland Government. And I, am, I have said in four papers now that that is absolutely spurious and it is leading to a colossal waste of water because it is just not recharging. And here's the recharge areas, you see. I've been walking around them and, uh, and they're solid, solid sandstones and uh, the farmers are getting mad that the, such places are being called recharge areas. But here they are. Here's, here are the recharge areas that have been proclaimed by the Queensland Government, all of that area there. The water is supposed to sink into the ground there and flow that way. Get the idea? And, uh, well, it's stupid. And so that's what's been happening. The total discharge from all flowing bores reached a maximum in 1917 and it's been going down ever since. But it's recharging, you see. <laughs> and, uh, and here's all the, see, there's all the flowing bores. But there's all, <laughs> there's all the non-flowing bores. Yeah. And what's been happening is they've just, they're just been peppering the place with boreholes. And they flow for a little bit and stop. Sometimes they don't even flow at all. And, uh, and the Queensland government are saying, yes, it's being recharged. And all the evidence is pointing the other way. Then there's the petroleum bores. And the release of methane was associated with a large number of the early deep boreholes. The methane was flared at night. This is a light and beacon. In 1914, the government geologists in Queensland noted that people were not interested in, in looking for the intake beds for petroleum. But he was ignored as a cynic. <coughs> Extraction of water over the past 100 years is equal to 100 times the volume of Sydney Harbour. So, if we're going to look at this, how did the water get into the crust of the earth? Okay, 
Because in order to talk about, say, the philosophy or the idea that the water isn't rainfall, I've got to prove where it came from. You ready? There we are. Now, this is the sort of things we're getting today from the space telescopes. Absolutely wonderful stuff. And you see all the red there? That is hydrogen. And they're finding that something like 95% of the universe seems to be composed of hydrogen. And the sort of thing that happens is that hydrogen, as if you like, is a basic molecule. And the solid constituents of what we see around us uh, 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 arises because of the, uh, the reconstruction of the hydrogen into larger molecules by nuclear forces. But the world has all of this hydrogen and the uh, yellow there is, is oxygen. So water is abundant in space as hydrogen and oxygen. And here's a star forming region in the Eagle Nebula. Nebula. The dense regions are mostly molecular hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas is enormous. This is the Crab Nebula. That was seen to explode in 1054 by the Chinese astronomers and recorded. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, in 1054 that was just a great explosion with light everywhere. Now it's that's what you see. The Orion Nebula is mostly hydrogen gas. Now all of this information is just pouring off the internet. The Sunflower Galaxy, wonderful, isn't it? Subaru Telescope. You see, this is up to date, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, double. And the Orion, waterfall in Orion. Mm. So, a major product of volcanoes is steam. It's the expansion of the steam that provides the enormous propelling forces that blow the tops off volcanoes and hurl disintegrated rock tens of kilometres into the air. So that is water coming out of the crust of the earth possibly a hundred kilometres down and more. There it is. That's Mount St. Helens. And this is the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Erupted between debris from the north flank. There it is. This vertical eruption was preceded by a catastrophic lateral blast. Ash and steam rose rapidly upwards. The vertical blast of steam and ash ascended 19 kilometres high. Can you imagine the energy that is released in throwing debris Rocks 19 kilometres into the sky. Absolutely enormous. Now, I have done a fair bit of work in... My work on the Great Artesian Basin has led me through the world's literature on volcanoes. I find that the volcanologists worldwide, to me, as far as I can see, have done no work whatever on what you could call the energetics or ballistics of volcanoes. And the sad thing is that even the volcanologists believe that the water that comes out of volcanoes like this is actually soaking into the ground nearby. And I'm saying, when it goes 19 kilometres high, I'm saying the water is underneath or in that rock. Now you can imagine, if there is water in the rock 100 or 200 kilometres down, and it's under pressure, and if due to a lateral expansion in the Earth's crust, that uh, rock is able to expand a little bit, you immediately have a situation where the relationship between the water and the rock creates forces. You see, the water is under enormous pressures, absolutely enormous pressures. And so a volcano like this should be seen as a gun barrel 100 kilometres deep, possibly, you know, and most of our observations are that uh, they must be dead vertical. <laughs> and go straight down just like a gun barrel. And what happens is that if there's a release of pressure a hundred kilometres down and there's an expansion of that water and rock conglomerate, it just explodes because the 
change in pressure on the way up. And so the ballistic propellant that throws that rock 19 kilometres into the air is the conversion of water to steam going up that gun barrel. So a volcano is a gun barrel that's been reamed <laughs> by the explosive release of disintegrated rock and steam. And if you have a look at the, uh, at the cores of these volcanoes, you can see them these days, of course, in the diamond pipes. <laughs> They're round and vertically down. So, but you see, in the oceans, we've now discovered water coming out of the deepest parts of the oceans. And these deep ocean vents, and they've been down there, and these are hot, sulfurous, acidic waters. And the incredible thing is that even the people that are studying these, they're still drawing diagrams showing that the water that's coming out of here is ocean water that, that's soaking in, into, the, into the floor of the ocean nearby. <laughs> now, they have tube worms growing in these waters. You know, there's all sorts of wonderful flora down there uh, growing in these hot acidic waters. So, now here's the seismicity of Australia. You can see that things to get, uh, this is over a 10 year period, nine, oh, 20 year period, 77 to 1970. You can see that the great volcanic, great uh, seismic activity there, there's a fair bit of seismic activity in the future that's going on. And of course the Great Artesian Basin is in here. So let's keep on going. So the shape of the basin, which is as you can see is sort of the saucer shape, I say that indicates the zone of lateral extension in the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is pulling apart and that's just sinking in. And, and uh, that has happened over a long time. And there's the lava fields. You can see they're all through there. There's this zone of lava fields. And you can see them over there. And here's the, we don't know about it, but you see, so here's all these volcanoes in Western Victoria. And over here in Mount Gambier, you've all been to the Blue Lake and you know what the Mount Gambier looks like. That's only, that volcano at Mount Gambier is only 5,000 years old, 4,500 years old. So we had an active volcano just off here in, in South Australia four and a half thousand years ago. So these things are fairly recent. And of course, uh, you see, this is the, how many of you have been to the Gold Coast? And, and you know the, uh, coming in from Tweed Heads, and you know the big thing that sticks out of the ground near Mwilimba? There it is. That's an old volcano. That was the largest extinct volcano in Australia. And uh, it's estimated that the top of it was possibly something like about uh, uh, three or thousand metres or so higher than the present ground level there. So it was a great big volcano. And that's right on the coast there. And that's in line with Newcastle where they had an earthquake in a few years ago. <laughs> now there you are. Okay. And that's what I believe. And there's the present heat flow. So, okay, where does the water come from? Where do the natural gas and oil come from? Are they different sources or the same source? Is there a sustainable flow of our heating water? Should we make better use of available surface water? Should we be starting now? In 2000, the Queensland Government passed legislation to proclaim the areas where the recharge of the Great Artesian Basin is considered to be occurring. The legislation was introduced without any notice to the affected landholders. It was a direct result of my activities in demonstrating that the water in the Great Artesian Basin is not rechargeable from surface waters. So the Queensland Government responded to my claims by saying that the water is not rechargeable by, by, from rain, rainfall by proclaiming the areas where the water's got to go into the ground anyway. So it, being in legislation, it must be right. The Act completes a century of error in understanding the origin of the waters in the Great Artesian Basin. There we are. Thank you. <laughs>